Now, several police officers have been deployed to the campus of the University of Education, Winneba, after ousted former Vice Chancellor Professor Mao Tuavoke stormed the university to reinstate himself. Addressing a news conference on the precincts, accompanied by some former members of staff who had also been dismissed by the university, the former VC claimed he had been cleared by the Economic and Organized Crime Office of abuse of office. As you are all probably aware, the anti graft agency Yoko followed a sustained probe into a number of allegations level against six officers of the university, including me, by the Professor Abekale Governing Council of the University of Education, concluded in black and white that we did not abuse our offices, nor were we in violation of any procurement process. This allegation formed the basis on which we were removed from office. It's also interesting to know that these dismissals were made despite the pendency of the case of the Supreme Court of the land at the time. We are back to our offices today to resume our rightful positions, knowing that there is no court prohibition on us and no notice of indictment from Yoko. We are delighted that the government institution, Yoko, has been professional and did a thorough independent investigation. This is clear evidence of a state institution working to ensure justice and fairness to its citizens. Way forward. During our press conference on the 16th April 2019, we argued for unity and harmony in the University of Education, Wiliba, as an important basis for growth and ensure a conducive environment for scholarship. The time has now come to realize these ideals. We are determined to sustain such an enabling environment working together with all relevant stakeholders. In that press conference, I also forgave Reverend Father Professor Fulbroni and Professor Becker for the roles they had played in this whole saga, this whole issue, and indicated a willingness to be part of a conversation to reconcile the university. Indeed, since that press conference, I have made a number of overtures, for example, contacting some members of faculty who have strong views against us through phone calls for the need for all to consider the greater interest of the university as foremost. I have gone on to discuss with them how we can all come together to rebuild the broken bridges of trust to ensure peace, harmony within the university. Given the tax ahead of us, these will be critical in refocusing the university and strategically positioning it for further growth, fairness and equal opportunity for all staff. Our Central Regional Correspondent Richard Kujinyaku joins us on the telephone line to help us better understand the issue. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Now, let's first look at this news conference addressed by Professor Mauto uh, Avoke. We see him standing, which is uh, quite unusual because we'd have expected that he would be seated at a table with uh, people listening in. Can you explain to us the circumstances under which he had to hold this news conference? Well, so in the morning, um, they went to the Ridiba High Court secure, to secure um, a writ and um, a motion on notice for the enforcement of the University of Education Act. So this is an application. And so they went to serve the police um, with, this co with a copy of this document and they proceeded to the council chamber to hold a press conference. The police, upon hearing that, decided that uh, they were going... The police advised them to stop because that is a wrong interpretation of the document that has been served them. And so they warned them not to do anything that will breach the peace of the university. So around uh, 1.30 p.m. today, um, the police got hints that the people had invaded the university uh, campus. They were in the administration and they were actually in the council chamber ready with a pressman to hold a press conference. The police, upon hearing that, went there and then drove them out of the, the, the council chamber. And so that is why you see the uh, former vice chancellor of the University of Mauto Avoke standing and addressing the press conference at the frontage of the university administration. Now, where was the current vice chancellor while all of this was going on? Well, we are told, I, I did not personally see him, but we were told by some of the university management that he was in his office, um, I mean, doing his uh, normal duties. And since then, we've not heard him speak a word about all that has been going on. So um, it is a case that 
we have um, the current vice chancellor, who is investiture. The president of the republic uh, presided over the minister of education was there and all of that. And after that, some snippet of information about Pete, how to reconcile the university so that the, uh, the university could move forward. And then there were, was also a petition uh, by some dismayed staff that led to some chaos um, uh, on campus that led to the closure for a reinstatement of the dismissed uh, lecturers, uh, including um, uh, Dr. K. Chidupu, who is a UTAC president. And so today at a press conference by Professor Mauta Avoke, the UTAC president, um, K. Chidupu, was there, as well as other five dismissed principal officers of the university uh, were also present at this uh, uh, press conference that was organized. Now, Richard, these other dismissed officers that you were talking about, are they also intending or claiming to be reinstated? Yes, they all claim that they are all affected by the decision of the um, Professor Nicholas Abakan's governing council. They were all affected by the decision they took to remove them from office. And so if the vice chancellor is coming back, then they might as well come with vice chancellor so that they all take their position. So if um, Professor Mauta Avocate takes the position as a vice chancellor, then they also occupy their respective offices uh, which they were removed. Now, you indicated that the, the deposed vice chancellor was not allowed to hold a news conference uh, in the chamber, and so he had to come out of the uh, university campus to do that. What is the next line of action for him and uh, the other colleagues? Well, um, my interaction with the people that came there suggests that tomorrow, God willing, uh, since he says that he is fortified by the court to resume or assume office as the substantive vice chancellor, he will come to the university campus and then um, try to get access to his office and work as the vice chancellor. So in this case, we might have two vice chancellors operating mm -hmm. uh, on the university campus of the University of Education, really, but because the university's position um, still remains that um, Professor um, Anthony Afubroni is the one that I mean, is clothed with that power to hold that office as the vice chancellor. But they do not know um, the current uh, thing that is happening where the former vice chancellor is coming back to work. And so tomorrow, um, all attention will be on the university as we see or we look at how it's going to all play out. All right, thank you very much, uh, Richard Kojonyaku, bringing us that update there from Winneba. Moving on, the Ministry of Roads and Highways has announced a closure of the Legonokonglo Road following a caving in of a section of it. The road caved in on Tuesday morning as a result of what officials say was spillage of an underground Ghana water supply line which weakened the base of the road. Communications manager at the Ghana Water Company, Stanley Marty, says customers in the eastern part of Accra will be without supply as a result, but assured repair works will soon begin. Our main transmission line from Pong right away to um, our Pong Reservoir going, um, going through this, this, the, this area. Okay, so you can see what has happened. And what happened was that in the middle of the night, there was a burst on the line. I'm sure... Uh, we are yet to ascertain, but I'm sure it's as a result of some high pressures or as a result of some heavy uh, vehicle loaded with maybe some, um, some goods, okay, impact on the pipeline. So it gave way and it washed um, the soil around that area. So obviously when there's a heavy um, load again, it will cave in. And that is exactly what has happened here. So we, we saw it, we had information on time, we shut the line down. We've invited in uh, urban roads and all other stakeholders so that we'll block this line and have the ex entire uh, stretch of pipeline changed. How long? Sorry. Okay. Yeah, we, are, we have invited in uh, urban roads to at least give us alternative routes because we may have to block this, this route. So by 8 p.m. tonight, we are going to block it okay. and then we'll give directions for the uh, alternative routes and then we'll start work immediately. And we are hopeful that within some 48 um, hours to 72 hours, we, we should be able to complete this job. And then urban roads will come in again to asphalt the place that we can have um, a, a perfect road. Yes, the whole uh, area, uh, East Legon, uh, Medina, Adenta area could be uh, affected depending on how we, um, uh, we are isolating the line. We are still uh, working on our network 
to see how best we can isolate a smaller area. But in the meantime, East Legon will be affected. Okonglo area will also be affected. And then the volumes of water into the main reservoir will be affected. So it's going to affect Where even... Where is the main reservoir? As of, it's at Okonglo, um, just behind the, um, the golf house. Um, um, Ghana Standards Authority, okay. um, that area. Then that reservoir serves the entire eastern part of Accra and then the central part of Accra. Oh, it means so, the entire eastern Accra will also be affected? Yes, of course. Okay. okay, and so we'll be working on this till we are done with the job, we are not going to leave the site. And we are hopeful that with latest within um, some three days, we should be able to complete the job. Now, a statement from the Ministry of Roads and Highways announcing the closure of the road, uh, me, me, but they also adding that the repair works will begin Tuesday. And so that's the statement. Temporary closure of a uh, section of Lake Onopunglo Road says the attention of the Ministry of Roads and Highways has been drawn to a section of the Lake Onopunglo Road that has caved in. This is as a result of the burst pipe underneath the road causing the section of the road to cave in. The ministry wishes to inform the general public that engineers from the Department of Urban Roads have assessed the situation this morning, that's Tuesday morning, and based on the assessment, that section of the road will be closed tonight from 10 p.m. for works to begin on it. The works will involve, first and foremost, the replacement of the pipe to allow residents to have access to potable water. Afterwards, the existing materials in the ground will be removed and replaced. Finally, the ground will be compacted before sealing. The whole process will take about a week. We entreat all road users to be cautious when approaching that section of the road and follow all road safety measures. The ministry wishes to assure the general public that all efforts are being put in place to improve the conditions of roads to ensure the safety and convenience of the road user. And uh, it's signed. It's coming from the public relations unit. And already our checks on that stretch of the road indicates that there's quite a bit of traffic build up. We're monitoring the situation and we will be updating our viewers uh, with the very latest, especially when the road is eventually closed in about 45 minutes. Moving on, some residents of Teman, Abakubi here in Accra, have taken their destinies into their own hands, mobilizing resources to fix their deplorable roads in the area. This, according to them, is because all attempts to get government to fix a 3.5-kilometer stretch are falling on deaf ears, despite the negative impact the, the poor state of the road is having on their lives. F.Y. Evans Cherry has been there and reports. This is Taiman Abokobi, a very busy town. The people here have one major problem, the deplorable nature of their roads. A ride on this bumpy and mutterable stretch leaves one reeling from all sorts of pain. This is what the people have to endure every day. Raphael Agble is a resident in the community. He tells me they are tired of the lip service the municipal assembly has been paying to them, hence their decision to embark on this project. They raised money and have purchased sand and stones to fill up and compact the 3.5 kilometer stretch of the road. About a month ago, when it rained, the whole place got flooded and my car was affected, you see. So we're taking upon ourselves, the Oak Villa Estate. You know, we have association. So we said we will fix the road ourselves because we can't wait for the government anymore. Because any time you complain, they will tell us they will come, they will come and nobody comes. So we want to do the road you know what we can do so that's what we are doing now how long has it been since you made your intentions known to the mce of this area oh that was uh, two weeks ago yeah we went to speak with her and then they told us that uh, the road has been awarded already so they are just waiting for the contractor to mobilize you know and then start work so for now it's raining every day and we can't wait for them. Do you see? They didn't give you any timelines when the contractor will start no. work? No, they didn't give us any timeline. So we took it upon ourselves that we are suffering. So we have to do it. Some commercial drivers are also livid over how this road is affecting their lives. The road, the, the road nature is bad. And we went to the assembly, we talked to them. They said the road is under contract. Once the road is under contract, we can't do anything. So sometimes we have to use our, some of our money to 
do some film of photos. That's what you do. But for now, dear, it's beyond our, it's beyond us. Another resident, Frederick Ishring, says something must be done sooner than later. Then even if there's an emergency where you must drive very fast, this bad nature will slow everything, will slow you down. The president said we should be citizens, not spectators. So we want to get involved. So we put ourselves together to get this road fixed temporarily whilst we wait for the actual work to be done. The MC for the area was, however, unavailable to comment on the matter. Drinking water, the taste is bitter, paying exorbitant prices for water and the risk of waterborne diseases, those are just few of the harsh living realities the residents of Aminapa in the Adan East District of the Greater Accra region have to endure daily. They depend mostly on rainwater for all their domestic chores and sometimes on the community stream if they are lucky. As part of our Safe Water Project, join us Henry Kwesi Badu, visited the community in our report. The source of water is unclean. Anytime my children drink the water, it upsets their stomachs, accompanied with diarrhea. At Aminapa, this water source is a lifesaver. A colored, unclean, and mostly unreliable bitter source of water. But to get even a cup here is a real struggle. The water here flows occasionally. Sometimes it flows once in two or three months. Because Samuel Tay Gaduga is head teacher of the only school in the community. According to him, the situation is very pathetic as children fall ill and miss school after drinking from this source. Are using here is not hygienic, and even this rain, uh, water that you are talking about is only rain season that we get this one. And when the school children take it, it worries them a lot. At times, they fall sick in the school, and uh, we have to invite the parents to come and come and send them to hospital. The route to the hospital too is very bad. Every household here has about four of these yellow 25 liter gallons for storing water. Helen Donu has three children. She pays for every gallon of water, which can barely take care of her many domestic chores. We travel several distances to fetch other sources of water, which is also unclean. To get portable water, we pay exorbitant prices to tricycle operators. I buy a gallon for two Ghana cities and about 50 Ghana cities in a month. 50 Ghana krana and so many in so they are my brepapa or krumuhasi. Tricycles supply water to residents here and other villages. For the drivers, this is good business. Patrick Amano is the only operator in the Aminapa area. One gallon is two city. You fetch it, 50 pesos at the Tobloku, then you come and sell it to city. Which means 15, one city, 50 pesos is the, the charge. I can get like. 150 Ghana cities, which is 1.5. I favor them sometime. I'll fetch it for you, then you you give me a time, then you, you get money to pay me. It's not difficult for me, but it's difficult for the person that are buying. But for me, there is good for me because I'm getting something. But the people who are paying the money, they are facing problems. <laughs> sometimes it rains small, it makes the road uh, so mad and I can't walk there. So when I can't walk there, I'll be in the house and there's no water. Maybe you go for somebody who has some, uh, some small water, then he give you and you use it for some time. When, when I get that, I can go there before you, you get your own. Okay, so how many trips do you go in a day? Uh, I go like six times a day. The Sustainable Development Goals recognize access to clean water as a basic human need. And help is on the way for residents in communities like Aminapa because Promacido Ghana Limited, as part of activities to climax its 20th anniversary, cut sword for the construction of a borehole for residents. Management of the company says this is one of 20 boreholes which will be constructed for other deprived communities across the country. 
My brand being existing in Ghana for 20 years, it's, we thought it's wise to give back to the community. Um, as I always say, we don't just come, we are not just here to do business, but we're also here to give back to the society where um, the, the society form an integral part of, 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 of the brand that we are building. Yes. So Kabbalah at 20, this is one of our initiatives to give back to the society by giving 20 boreholes to the 10 regions in Ghana. And this is the first place that we've chosen to, to, to offer our... Uh, Chief of Aminapa, Nene Amate Kole, who was grateful for the kind gesture, wants management of Pumacido Ghana Limited to hurriedly construct the borehole to ease the plight of his people. The water there, we went to Alavanyo to fetch the water before drinking or bathing. Mm. From, Alavan, from here to Alavanyo, it's about two bus before you go fetch the water. So with the sofa, with the sofa, Sometimes from 3 o'clock evening, we will move for Alabama before you fill the water, you come. By 6.30, you move from here to Pute, to the school. So with the sofa, it will be small. The cowbell, now they will bring the change, some change, plenty of change come. Mm. So now, we, if they, they do the move for us, now they will be free. So everything will come. To teach. I will thank them so that they are grateful. God will help them to do the, the thing they say they do for us. That God will help them to do for us. For Joy News, Henry Kwesi Badu's report. We bring you a picture story on challenges rural communities face in their search for water. The pictures are by photojournalist Jojo Kobner. Deputy Minority Spokesperson on Trade and Industry, Suleimana Yusuf, is worried about the slow pace of his parliamentary committee's work seeking to resolve the current impasse between foreigners engaged in retail trade and their local counterparts. The committee was tasked by the Speaker of Parliament to probe the matter, which many say could escalate unless readily dealt with. Suleimana Yusuf's remarks come a day after the two parties clashed at Opera Square here in Accra. There's more in the following report. The Ghanaian retailers on Monday headed to Opera Square in Accra once again as they sought to lock up the shops of Nigerian traders. This was scattered by the police. Deputy Minority Spokesperson on Trades and Industry Committee, Suleiman Ayusif, is worried about the slow pace of the work his committee is doing on foreigners engaged in retail trade. We sat down, we scheduled a timetable where we were supposed to now meet them one after the other so that we are able to get to the bottom of this issue. Unfortunately, uh, I must admit that my committee is not doing the, uh, the writing. Uh, for some time now, we've not been able to meet. I follow the chairman and all those who matter in the committee, and uh, we're not getting any results. I think that my committee must set up, and I have a personal problem uh, with the way the leadership of my committee is handling the issue. In any case, let's be honest with ourselves. There's a law that we all are not comfortable with, either in terms of how it is framed or in terms of its implementation. And it is only this House that can do something about it. Deputy Majority Whip Matthew Nindam, however, says leadership will ensure that the committee completes its work. It will also mean that we have to, the referral that was made, we need to call on it immediately. If they haven't made it, should meet immediately and make sure that at the end of the day, we are able to solve it. Because when we, we, we all decide to play like the ostrich, 
tomorrow it will backfire and all of us cannot handle it. I remember last week a statement was even made on the floor on this particular issue and we all must admit that it's worrying. We have Chinese who have taken over our markets, we have Nigerians who have taken over the retail sector, which we think that is not making a lot of, it's not, making, it's not providing a lot of room for our people to operate. But if you also go and interrogate these issues further, most of these foreigners that are doing this retail, most of our people are fronting for them. Most, if you go to the shops today, you see somebody sitting down there, he's a Ghanaian, but behind that Ghanaian is a Chinese who is also operating. It's not clear how soon the report of the committee will be completed and made public. Well, on this very matter, the police is warning the traders to stay away and avoid taking the law into their own hands, but they, on the other hand, are one are asking the police or are daring the police to first arrest foreign retailers before descending on its members. Now we're returning to our earlier story which has to do with the closure of the road uh, at Okpunglo following that caving. Latif Idris is standing by to give us the very latest updates. Hello Latif, we're learning that work has begun on uh, that portion of the road that caved in. You bring us that update. Yeah Israel, work as we speak is ongoing and we've been told by the Ghana Water Company that they are going to work 24-7. So once the work has started, they are not ending until the work is done and dusted. Because as we speak, there is a challenge for water supply for the people who live in this enclave as a result of this pipe burst. It is really affecting the people in this area. And so the water company, we are told, is going to work around the clock to ensure that the challenge is fixed before they leave the scene. Now, once the Ghana Water Company finishes with its work, it will be the turn of Urban Road to also come and fix this portion of the road that we can see caved in earlier. Ongoing is the work of the Ghana Water Company. We are told if the camera can just capture this pipe that we have here, we are told this is going to replace what is currently underneath the road. Uh, this one is more durable, we are told by the Ghana Water Company, and can withstand the pressure that the normal PBC pipe couldn't withstand. Uh, that resulted in its giving up, breaking up, and then the water that emanated from the pipe, we are told, is what washed the soil underneath the road which eventually caved in. So, again, Israel, the Ghana Water Company is telling us that they are going to work around the clock to ensure that the work is completed before they leave the scene. Talk about traffic situation. The ongoing project didn't really affect the flow of traffic here. We can see that portion of the road was blocked, but then the operators here ensured a smooth flow of traffic and even on our way coming here we didn't experience any huge traffic situation and it is very evident here as well there is free flow of traffic and that is something that must be commended so Israel once again work is ongoing we are told it's going to continue for not less than three days when they are done the Urban roads will also come in to do their bits, then the road will eventually be open to, uh, for motorists to use. All right, Lajiv, I'd like you to explain uh, something to us. You're, you're talking about a part of the road being closed, so I'd like you to get us to aperture because you're saying it has an affected traffic. Maybe at this time of the night, there's not that much uh, traffic on the road, and so we're not really experiencing it, but we don't know what the situation will be like maybe tomorrow morning. Uh, during Russia. So if you could explain exactly how this road closure or where exactly this road has been closed at. Israel, if you can take that again. 
So explain to us where exactly or which portion of the road has been closed. Because we're, we're learning that a part of it has been closed. Okay, so uh, I'm not very familiar with the road network here. But Israel, if you are coming from the Legon campus, heading towards Bawaleshi, so from the Legon campus straight down to Bawaleshi, that section of the road is what has been blocked by the urban roads. We have some of the earth moving machines that are being used for the fixing of the road parked right on the shoulder of that portion of the road. And so that is, that is the only portion of the road that has been blocked. And not entirely blocked, it's just been cordoned off somewhat so that the cars are using the other side of the road and then just the other part of it that is being blocked. Uh, that is why we are having a free flow of traffic. But we do not know if the situation will change tomorrow morning once we have a lot of people heading towards their workplaces and the number of vehicles having to increase on the road. Now, once again, you indicated that the Ghana Water Company is looking at using a more durable kind of pipe uh, for the correction, that they, the fixing of the, the pipe that they're going to do there. Do you get any indication that they intend to probably replace all the pipes or the less durable pipes that are underneath most of these roads? For, for this section of the road, Israel, the answer is yes. That is what the workers of the Ghana Water Company are telling us. We have a number of the pipes here, and we are told that they are going to fix and replace the pipes underneath that have been used over the years. And so for this section, the, the answer is yes, Israel. They are going to replace all the pipes and replace them with uh, this more durable pipes. We are told that what we have underneath is the PVC, ordinary PVC pipe. And so this one is more durable. And so they are going to replace with the, the ones that are underneath Israel. All right, thank you very much, uh, Latif Idris, bringing us that update there from uh, Ukunglu at East Legon. Moving on, a civil servant with the Ministry of Youth and Sports captured in the investigative piece on corruption in football by Anas Arume Anas has been presented with the Civil and Local Government Staff Association Clocksack Award for Integrity 2019. The protocol officer, Diana Dakwa Boating, was seen rejecting a bribe in the number 12 documentary. Extracts of a citation given to her read, by your insistence on the right procedures to be followed in the face of the supposed entrapment and the gentle smile with which you rejected the inducement, you have brought hope and honor to your colleagues who are faced with, it, with this ethical dilemma every day. Maxwell Agbagba has more. <laughs> The Nathan Anang Kwau Hall at the Clocksack head office where some members of the singing band made up of civil servants are treating guests to some music. In Anas Aramayao Anas's expose, an unseen individual is seen handing over word of cash on the table of the protocol office of the sports ministry. The money was to get her to help with visas for some unofficial persons. She rejected the cash and gave it back to the man who dropped it on the table. Diana's strength to resist the temptation has earned her the 2019 Nathan Anankwao Award for Integrity. The number 12 documentary shook the foundation of Ghana's football industry. Over 70 referees were caught on tape taking bribes. Depending on where you stand, you may as well describe them as gifts. What brought shame to many has brought honor to Dakua Boati. Diana Dakua Boatin 
has been talking about the moment she realized she was captured in the documentary. I only remembered when I saw the video and I was so surprised because I wasn't expecting myself to be part of that. I mean, I was so surprised. Yeah, he gave me, he came there with the money and we had um, a discussion and then I actually told him, no, I don't work like that. My professional ethics doesn't allow me to take anything. So, I mean, I just gave it back to him. But later when you saw it on TV, what was going through your mind that it could have been you in that situation? Yes. Um, when I saw it, I don't know. I don't know. I was short of words. I, 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 I couldn't just imagine the person's thoughts, I mean, what brought him there, you see, I don't know. We should always work with our professional ethics. We should always be as honest, truthful, and ready to save. Diana's husband, George Boaten, is proud of his wife. I least expected to see her, but uh, I feel so proud today to see her having this award today, I feel very proud. And we give thanks to God. The family is proud of her. Everybody is proud of her. Meanwhile, incoming dean of the University of Ghana Business School, Professor Justice Baole, says ex gratia for people he describes as political civil servants or heads is unfair. It must be scrapped if civil servants can't also be beneficiaries. Speaking at the award ceremony, the University of Ghana Business School lecturer stated the conditions of civil of service for civil servants must be improved. But closer can join the media on the conversation around S. Gracia. I think that thing must stop. If it must not stop, everybody must get it. Because it is not, it is not acceptable that somebody that we were together the, the, the last time, he joined DC or he became MP. The next four years, he's the richest man in the district. Why? And, and apart from that, he's going to get S, X Gracia 1, S Gracia 2, S Gracia 3. Why? I, I don't think that it is fair. As a country, we must be fair to all of us because we matter. And I say we must be fair to all of us because we are all constitutionally mandated agencies of the state. And therefore, when it is about appropriating the resources of the nation for all the agencies, all the agencies must be treated well. Truth is, you are the one who can do it. Now, if I can't give the letter and I can leave the next day, I can get removed or ask to go on leave and I'm going to sit home and all of that. Why should you have been treated like a politician and be given an S Russia equivalent to the number of years I've worked, four months per year for the number of years I've worked, and all of that, and that will be calculated and I'll be giving, I'll be giving uh, uh, back back loan to buy a big car and, and I am living today and I cannot pay for it and therefore I will take it along free of charge and I should have a garden boy, something boy, something boy and Kofi Wai will say, give you free condom, they get it. <laughs> so, so the point that I'm making is that the conditions of service of, of the civil servant must be looked at again. To be honest, it is not good enough. It is not good enough. It is not good enough. I was, I was a co-chair of the technical committee that revised the public sector reform strategy for the office of the senior minister. And one, one of the things that we talked about a lot was the fact that I do not see why political civil servants earn more than other civil servants. Then the political civil servants are those that get appointed the CEO of that, CEO of the CEO of that, and, and sometimes they come in as consultants and, and all of that. And they are on a different pay scale. But if they are coming to do the job that we have been doing all the time and we merit peanuts, why should they be paid something bigger than that? The Congo Senior High School in the Nabdam district of the Upper East Region will remain closed for at least another two weeks, while the committee set up to investigate the riot that led to the closure on Monday continues its work. The Sandema Senior High Technical School in the Wilsa North District of that region will also remain closed for the same period for investigations to continue. Upper East Region correspondent Albert Sori has more. This was revealed by the Upper East Regional Minister, Paulina Abayaga, after she held a crisis meeting with heads of Second Cycle Schools on Tuesday. The spate of riots in Second Cycle institutions in the Upper East Region 
had become a matter of security concern for the regional minister, who earlier Tuesday summoned all heads of senior high schools to their meeting. On Monday, the Congo Senior High School in the Nabdam district was closed down following riots by students of a school. The riots are said to have been started by students of two ethnic groups in the school after a disagreement ensued between them. This came only a week after the San Demasina High Technical School was shut down following a riot that led to the death of one student. There have been many of such riots in the last one year in several other schools. Upper East Regional Minister Paulina Bayage briefed journalists in the region. Um, yesterday we had Congo Senior High closed down. Sandema, we are informed, um, was as a result of cadets taking charge to discipline students, which didn't go well. Um, so the students rioted. And just uh, the day before yesterday, in the night, Congo Senior High, uh, students misbehaved. In fact, that's, that's the dangerous uh, part among all them because it took ethnic lines. We are told talented students fought for our first students. That's amazing. Because they are they're just, they're presents. <laughs> Maybe we should bring one about to sit down and talk to them. She also shared their recommendations after the meeting. We shouldn't use the cadets to supervise our students. We have Prefects that have been elected, and we are expecting that as teachers and as heads of institutions, we will work with our teachers and the prefects together so that uh, we will empower these students, these uh, prefects, to be doing some of the supervisory work. But we also agree as teachers that we need to do more in our own supervisory work. One, supervise the Teachers who have been given authority, like form masters, house masters, senior house mistresses, and masters, and all that. We need to supervise them as of institutions. We can also listen to the Upper East Regional Education Director, Ogas Nayirezan, who has been cautioning teachers on how to handle senior high school students. Open up all the communication lines and involve them in school administration. For the first years, for the double classrooms, Currently, the final years have completed the second years at home, so the first years. And so we want to suggest that the class prefects, whom the students themselves elected to be their leaders, and those they elected to represent them at the SRC, they should be the leaders of the institutions and school management should work with these leaders instead of the cadets so that they are able to instill discipline and communicate what management wants to do to comply with. Albert Soris reports for Joy News.